Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay. I'm on a mission to help entrepreneurs advance society. And as you've probably heard before, this podcast is part of that effort. Uh, today, we've got a normal partner meeting rundown with a little changes. Uh, Brett had a family situation, so he's out today. There'll be no blockchain update. And Mike is actually hella skiing with his team right now. So we are in Jackson Hole for a team offsite. Um, I'm the old man who doesn't ski anymore. And so the rest of them are causing trouble and I'm here recording. Uh, before we jump in, though, today I wanted to also riff on a little bit of a topic. Every now and then, if you've been listening to this for a while, you'll hear that I'm a pretty big history nerd. I was just finishing out Dan Carlin's latest hardcore history episode, which is covering uh, kind of the evolution of the Viking era. Uh, fascinating. If you're into that, I highly recommend. Um, but there's a, there's a documentary out that I think is may, maybe more broadly consumable that I think is pretty interesting context. Now, before I jump into it, I'm going to disclaim any documentary, you're getting kind of a one-sided show and there's other color that you're not seeing in context. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but HBO has a documentary out called Novelny, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his last name. And it's about Alexei Novelny. If you haven't heard of him, he is basically the opposition leader to Putin in Russia. Uh, the documentary is really wonderful in that it is a present firsthand account of um, his journey from running against Putin to actually being poisoned, them confirming that he was poisoned by the government of uh, Russia with the intent to kill him, him surviving, and then him deciding to return to the government. And the psychology he's going through and all that, it's kind of all real time. Uh, what I think is super powerful about it is in some ways, if the documentary is true to form, and there are other criticisms I'm sure of him out there, already talked to some other buddies that I know from the region. Uh, he kind of plays like a Nelson Mandela of Russia and is currently in jail uh, in a pretty ugly place. So it's an interesting story. He's in our headlines every now and then, but I think most Americans and probably other people listening to this get little snippets about who this man is, but they don't really have a sense of the man and the character uh, and the narrative. Uh, I thought this documentary does an incredible job. It's about an hour and a half. It's movie format, which is not a given these days uh, with TV being so awesome. Uh, and uh, I think it's short to the point and uh, entertaining. Um, so highly worth a watch. Uh, again, HBO novelty. And with that, let's jump into the partner meeting. Fong, Ireland. What do you have for us today? Hey, Mark. Um, yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about partnerships, which I think is a really powerful marketing tool and one that a lot of startups aren't using enough. If you choose the right brand to work with and you set up the relationship in the right way, partnerships can be a really cheap, fast way to build growth. Um, and there's a few ways in how they do that. So one is that they build trust. So if you're a relatively unknown startup and you're partnering with a bigger, more established brand, it can immediately give you credibility. So, you know, for example, let's say you get lucky and you're able to create a partnership with Zoom. Oh, well, Zoom is partnering with this brand I've never heard before. They're obviously vetted and trustworthy because Zoom is a reputable brand. Number two is um, they build relevance. So it can plug you into a conversation or a cultural moment or a customer journey that you don't currently have access to. Um, partnerships can let you share with your customers the social issues and the topics that you care about in a way that you can't do on your own. So for example, when I worked with an apparel brand that was all about body positivity, we partnered with the National Eating Disorders Association on a bunch of activities. That strengthened our position on body positivity, and it showed a different dimension to our brand. It also allowed us to financially support a cause that we cared a lot about. And then third, Partnerships give you access to new audiences. So working with another brand introduces your brand to their audience and allows you to build that top of funnel that hopefully you can turn into conversions. So now that we've talked about how powerful partnerships can be, let's talk a little bit about how you choose a good partner. So number mm -hmm. one, find complementary brands. So complementary brands have a similar audience, but is not a competitive business. So if your business targets a Gen Z customer, 
working with a brand that speaks to an older customer probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And your brands don't have to have the same equities, but they do need to share the same core values and ethics. So going back to the example I used earlier, as a brand that messaged about body positivity, we would just never partner with a weight loss brand or a brand that had a very narrow definition of beauty. Number two, as a startup, it's helpful to pick brands that are more well-known and have a bigger audience. So if you're relatively new and you have 5,000 Instagram followers, partnering with a brand that only has 2,000 followers, probably not a great use of resources if you're really concerned about growing your, your following. And number three, Find partners that you enjoy working with and be a good partner. You want to build relationships for the long term, and this is essential to doing that. Now, once you find a partner, what are different ways you can partner with them? So there's a lot here, and I'll probably come back in a later episode to dive more deeply into it, but here are some ideas that can get you started. Uh, Number one is social media collaborations. So Instagram takeovers, joint reels, or joint Instagram live. I actually find that contests and giveaways can be really effective. When I ran a fashion brand, we once increased our Instagram following by 50% by doing a giveaway with four other more well-known brands in the beauty and food space. So, you know, we got access to four additional audiences just by giving away, you know, a one single item of clothing. Uh, number two, cross promotions. So, for example, if you're a software company, Bundling your product with a trial subscription to a partner brand can build awareness and trial for both brands. And then number three, events. In-person events can bring your brands to life in a way that um, you know, can be shared in both brands' marketing channels. And it's just a great way to showcase your partnership. So that's all I have for today. Hopefully, um, I was able to convince you of the huge opportunity that partnerships can create and that I spark some ideas that can get you started. Fong, very thorough and awesome as always. Um, I just want to double click on one thing you said that I just think needs to be echoed. Being a good partner, just building the relationships and being honest and following through and doing the things you say, that's big. The people you're going to interact with at those companies will go to similar companies typically and can open up more doors. And you know, one thing that I think most people don't understand when they're early in their business careers is that everyone keeps moving through the next 30 years of their careers and the relationships you have matter. So uh, very, very good advice across the board. Um, I also want to toss out, I think a good topic in the future would be how to secure these because it's really hard for some small companies to pull this off. Um, Yeah, I agree with that. uh, This was a very good one. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. See you guys next week. Hey, Chris, before we start, I know you're a big tennis fan. In my opinion, you're not a very good player. Separate issue. Um, All right. but, yeah, well, that's a low bar. Uh, but uh, what do you think about the Djokovic situation? He took, he took down your boy Rafa, right? For the record, he did not take down my boy Rafa. He equaled the Grand Slam titles that Rafa has. He just won the Aussie Open while injured. So, you know, kudos to him, but um let's see i think rafa will come back on top and and once uh at the french in, in in a couple of months we'll see and for the record for everyone i am a usda four and a half so i'm pretty good <laughs> what four and a half like what's that like it's like junior it's junior varsity in high school right isn't that what you no nah, it's it's okay it's a it's a, a little a little above above average let's say but you know mark, mark where are you negative now you're, just, now you're just being polite <laughs> No, I mean, <laughs> if you don't, if you can allow an underhand serve, I'm probably at least a three. Right. An underhand That's serve right. required. Underhand serve required. <laughs> pickleball serve. Uh, yeah, sure. no, pickleball has been my go-to sport. A um, little easier on the news. And I figure most people playing it are 75. So I have a lot, I have 30 years to kind of get ahead. And like age into it. So by the time I kind of am age appropriate, I'll be really good. That's my thinking. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Tell me about the market. What do we got? Sure. Um, this, this week is straightforward. Three major things happened here that uh, everyone should know about. The Fed, earnings, and jobs. So let's start, let's start with the Fed. Um, we had yet another FOMC meeting this week where the Fed decides uh, what to do with interest rates. 
uh, the, the short of it is uh, there's no surprises here. 25 basis point hike, bringing us to 4.5 to 4.75% range. Um, the, this is the smallest hike since the hiking path started almost a year ago. Uh, but coming into this, uh, you know, market, it, it was 100% priced in. So in itself, that this wasn't really market moving. But all the attention was given to the statements that followed uh, by, by the Fed officials. Uh, and there are plenty to digest here for, for, for both the, the, the doves and what we call doves and hawks. So doves are, are um, uh, people who believe in, uh, uh, you know, an easing of, of interest rate policies and hawks are, are, are the opposite, which is more, tight, more tightening of, of the policy. So on the, so on the dove side, the key sentence here to watch, and, and, and everyone's talked about this, is Chairman Powell came out and said, and I quote, the disinflationary process has started. Specifically, he also mentioned that the easing of the inflationary pressure from goods as opposed to services, we kind of talked about this last week, and housing. He also highlighted that the, missing, the, the only missing ingredient here is disinflation in core services, excluding housing. And this is further, further evidenced by the ISM data that came out uh, just now, and it's, it's incredibly strong. So we're still not there yet, is basically what he's saying. And on the hawkish side, he basically said the Fed needs, and I quote, substantially more evidence to be confident that inflation is on a sustained downward path and could still deliver a couple more hikes. So, yeah, that, so that's, that's what happened. And, and basically, there are plenty to digest from both sides. And market kind of took it uh, um, positively at the end uh, when, when all, all said and done and, 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 and rally a little bit on, on the back of that. So what are we expecting the Fed to do going forward? I mean, clearly he's sending very carefully mixed messages. I think those words are probably very yeah. scripted, um, right? Yeah. What, what do we think is going to happen now? Are we at the end of this or what's the deal? So look, the, I, th I think I mentioned this last week too, where, where the, the attention on Fed interest rate policies uh, will still be there always, but, but the focus will be on it less and less uh, going forward. Specifically, what if you look at the short-term interest rate market, short-term short interest rate futures, specifically FF on futures, um, market's expectation of Fed decision is still sort of all over the place, in my opinion, right? So market is pricing in currently a peak interest rate of 5%, which means we're only 50 basis point away. But market is still pricing a 25 basis point cut in December of 2023, so this year. And, and the Fed has come out and said, even during the statements uh, that was released this week, that that is not gonna happen. And more importantly, the, by next summer, the, the market is pricing in at a 100 basis point cut by let's mm -hmm. say May, 2024. The question here that we wanna ask is, is that too aggressive? Is that too accommodative? Is that too rosy? Of, of of what you know of the expectation, and if your conclusion is yeah, hundred basis point, point cut, no, you know, no, no, there's no supporting evidence that'll happen. You know, uh, labor market is still very strong, so we, as we'll talk about in a bit, and and likely there's been a soft landing. Then then you really have to question why um, we need a hundred basis point cut. Why can't interest rates stay on course and, and elevated for for longer than that? And so if your conclusion is no, if we won't get there, then there will be some adjustment downward in risky assets for sure. All right, more to watch. What else is going on? Second thing I want to talk about, um, if you don't have any more questions, uh, earnings, which is it's been a big, yeah, hit it. big topic this week. Yeah. So long story short, again, big week for tech com tech companies, and the results are um, at back at best a really a big a big mixed bag. So Apple posted a five percent revenue drop, and Cool did an underwhelming sales across basically all of its flagship products in iPhone, Max, and, and wearables. Amazon showed the least profitable holiday quarter since two thousand fourteen, and the largest annual loss on, on record. More importantly, what has been Amazon's only bright spot in, in earnings in recent years, the you know, AWS and cloud computing business is also guiding lower expectation for Q1 this year. So that wasn't good for sentiment. 
And Alphabet also missed uh, expectation for both top line and, and bottom line, um, citing effectively a slowdown in advertising spend across YouTube and Google search. Again, it's, it's core business. So that's on the downside. On, on upside, Meta, which is probably the only outlier here, um, basically beat analyst earnings, analyst expectations across the board. And, and simultaneously, it also announced a, I'm sure it was planned, uh, a share buyback program effectively passing all the cost savings from uh, you know, the, the, the internal cuts and expense restructuring uh, straight to shareholders. So that's music to any investor's ears. And, and, and no surprises there, uh, stock actually rallied 20% this week uh, on the back of that. So yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's, it's a lot, a lot has happened, you know, things are still trickling in. So we're not at the end of the uh, earning seasons yet. But the big names have come out and uh, generally guiding towards a weaker economy this year and weaker expectations and, and earnings uh, with a few surprises on the upside. But this is what you, told, you, you keep saying. This is like the second phase of the contraction of the market that the Fed's initiating, right? Like there's no surprise yeah. in this. And I assume it's bleeding beyond tech. So you've got these earnings bopping all over the place, but the market's up. Yeah. Right. So how do we how do we reconcile the two? Is it, you know, to me, it's like, are people just happy to see that we're in the second phase and they know what this means? Or is there something else happening that's driving the market back up? Yeah, no, fair question. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is S&P is up 9% year to date. Right. There's no denying that. But if you, as usual, if you if you, if you look a little deeper and, and look at the sectors of S&P and you'll see something very clear. So last year, people said, oh, you know, uh, we've been in a bubble for a long time. So it's about time for a mean reversion. And sure enough, um, many segments, including tech, uh, were hit majorly last week, sorry, last year. But what we've seen year to date so far is what I would consider a mean ver reversion to yet last year's mean reversion. Okay. Um, and for instance, if, if you look at, if that makes any sense. It does. But if you yeah. look at, the segments of S&P that were hit hardest last year. We're talking about consumer discretionary that are down 38% last year. Communication services that are down 41% last year. Real estate down 29%. Infotech down 29%. These just happen to be the segments that led the rally year to date. So consumer discretionary up 15%. Communication services up 14%. Real estate 9%. Infotech 9%. So, and this is how it always happens, right? Market tends to overshoot in both upside and downside. So the way I'm looking at this shows to me that at least that this is a mean reversion to last year's, last year's major sell-off in, in these sectors. And so on the flip side, you know, sectors that actually performed okay last year. Yeah. Was last year's sell-off too extreme? Or, and this is the correction or... How do we interpret that? Yeah. Look, market is never moving in straight lines, right? So, so you can argue that last year's sell-off wasn't extreme enough on a you know, 10-year, 20-year basis. But in, the fact of the matter is one year, S&P down 20%, all these sectors down 40%, 50%. That's a lot of volatility to the downside in one year. So there, it's, it's almost sort of... It's, 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 it's due for a correction to the upside when, you know, your forward multiples, your P earning, P multiples are, have adjusted below five-year running average. It's, it's normal for it to correct a little bit to the upside. But will this sell-off right. continue? That's, that's a different question. I, I personally believe, I, my, personally, I believe that we are, we're, we're, we're likely to test the bottom again at some point. Um, so this could still be just a relief rally. And more importantly, a mean reversion to the mean reversion last year. Okay. And what's going on with jobs? Anything significant there? Right. So, so jobs. <laughs> this is this is the most interesting thing. So, non -farm, We just got the non. This is hot off uh, hot off the press uh, 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 from this morning. We got the non-farm payroll data for January, and this came in as an absolute shocker to basically everybody. Um. In the month of January, the U.S. economy added 517,000 jobs, which is three times the expectation. 
by everybody on Wall Street. And subsequently, the, the, the unemployment rate dropped to a 54-year low at 3.4%. Um, on top of that, there were also upward rev revisions to both the November and December data. Okay, so incredibly, incredibly strong data. Uh, the, the, the one interesting thing here, before I talk about what I think about the implications of this, is that the growth of average, average hourly earnings is actually coming down. Uh, year to year on year, that was up, we're, so we're up 4.4 percent, which is about 20 basis points lower than the number in December. And so that this is a little bit of a juxtaposition here, right? So you've got an economy that's added so many jobs, but um, wage growth is, is slowing down. So this could be a combination of maybe the jobs that are added are, are more on the lower paying side, or just because empl employers are still hoarding employees hoarding jobs, but are trying to, to control wage increase, right? Trying to not pay out this, these big bonuses in the year on Wall Street and, and whatnot, and, 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 and just sort of trying to wait out this, this so-called uh, uh, soft landing uh, that could transpire this year. So, so that's what happened, and, and um, a, a, an absolute shocker. I mean, what, yeah, it's all in my awesome. mind, Exactly. People are so digesting this. So this will take a week for people to really dig in and find out what, what happened. Uh, but I mean, some, some implication on this from my, from my mind so far is, look, uh, the, we've, seen all, we've all seen the news. The tech companies are firing, but it will take time to show up the data, right? These, a lot of these sort of job cuts are, 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 are being implemented over two to three, four months, a quarter. And uh, and maybe also compensated by some hirings in, in, in certain sectors are finally coming out of the recover coming out of COVID, like travel entertainment. Yeah. So there's some offsetting effect on that. And but there's no question that this data will give the Fed more dry powder to sort of stay on course and with the hikes and, and maintain at least maintaining higher interest rates going forward. Got it. Got it. Very helpful. Um, and would, to my mind, this is yet another sort of strong indication of a potential soft landing in the economy. Uh, which I appreciate that that that's the macro perspective that's always so helpful is that like hey this this approach is kind of working there's a lot of problems with it and but yeah the, so the soft landing concept is kind of the dream hey um, I want to do one more topic uh, the media has had uh, a lot of saber rattling in the American media but in U S China dynamic in the last couple of weeks yeah um, there's a balloon that was flying over doing surveillance in Montana. I don't know what the hell's in Montana that anyone cares about, right? Nothing against Montana. It's great. But like, what's the strategic significance of a balloon there? I don't know. Um, yeah. Is there a military base? Like, what are they looking at? The, uh, you know, there's a, uh, we're expanding our military operation in the Philippines. And then I read um, yeah. uh, one of my newsletters that I get. Uh, signal excellent newsletter for folks who are interested in geopolitics and the underlying subtext is our news headlines are saying hey we now have four military bases in the philippines but apparently that doesn't actually change our military capability because the first two military, mm. military bases were so large we don't need the extra two and so yeah. it sounds a lot like you know we've also got the general who had the leaked paper leaked who knows what's up yeah that hey we're going to be in world war three or war with china in two years who knows? But there is a media narrative that's coming out in America that I think is prepping people for an escalated conflict. And mm. I don't know the level to which that's by design or just by a myriad of little anecdotal things that are re reflecting a, a, a conflict. Um, for those who, uh, Chris, haven't, don't know too much about you yet, I, uh, Chris came over from China at 16. Obviously, he, English is his second language, which is uncanny, given he has almost no accent. Um, what is the narrative in China? What, what are yeah. people hearing in China? Because I know you listen to the media over there. Um, yeah. If we're kind of getting light, like, hey, things are kind of going south, what are they hearing? Yeah, no, good question here. I, I, I do track um, uh, both sides media. I, I don't like to be one side. I like to hear um, on the ground of what sort of everyone is, is really saying about this. You know, I think 
since the opening of uh, of the country, after, you know, in the aftermath of COVID in China, um, the attention, at least in Chinese media, has been more focused on uh, the economy and, and everything else. A lot of these sort of news headlines you see in the, in the states, um, they're, they're to me, they're they're not so much as you know escalation. It's more posturing. It's more deterrence. Than, than 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 an escalation, and and the, the Chinese media has been largely ignoring all these things. You know, the Philippine news, and and of course, this balloon, <laughs> which they are just claiming is, is a civilian uh, aircraft. It's not. It's not a military operation. Who knows? I mean, we'll find out in twenty or thirty years when the historians write about it. Exactly. I, mean, I think the Ch- China is trying to defuse the conflict and focus on economy right now because they they need it. Right. And, 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 and if they're going to do something about Taiwan, they need to first fix up their economy first. Um, and given the real estate sector is still in a slum right now, um, but everything else is sort of booming, jobs coming back, shops are being open and people are, lives are almost 100 percent back to normal pre-COVID. Uh, that's their focus right now. So so I wouldn't read too much into what's happened in the past couple of weeks. I will focus on the broader picture. OK, so what? So once, you know, they fix up the economy, that what, it, you know, is, is the attention be, going to be shipped back to Russia, Ukraine and, and Taiwan? And, um, and, and, and I do think there is some preparation work done on that front, maybe in, in, in underground in, in China. Uh, not, I don't believe they want to, uh, and from China's side, want to escalate, escalate any attention with, with the U.S. But, but the U.S. is feeling the pressure for sure, right? With, that the economy is sort of uncertain at best right now, um, uh, but China is, is is fast growing and fast recovering and and taking over a lot of the resources and, and setting up operations globally. So it's it's yeah, it's a it's a it's more it's more about deterrence. Chris, insightful as always. Thank you, buddy. Pleasure. Talk to you later, Mark. And a quick reminder for everybody listening: Chris is a SEC registered RAA. So nothing he said should be construed as investment advice. All right, cool. That's the part of meeting for today. Uh, We're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, We've got a special guest on today, Tomer Bigger, who's the founder and CEO of Noble, an Israeli-based company uh, that we're actually investors in and pretty psyched about. They are doing some really interesting stuff in and around the embedded finance space. And so he's going to train us up a little bit about what he's doing in the industry. So hope you enjoy. Tomer, thanks for being here, buddy. Appreciate you joining us. Great to see you, Mark. All right. Before we jump into what you're doing over at Noble, can you give us an overview? Sure. So basically, the main thesis around embedded finance is um, saying that today, consumer or businesses, the main way for them to consume financial products is from the banks or the, you know, the incumbents, the financial um, institutions that we all know. Um, embedded finance basically says that we as consumers are going to start consuming different financial services, not necessarily from a bank. It can be either a software or a platform that we are using. Best example I always give is Shopify. I'm an e-commerce seller on Shopify. I might also uh, be using a working capital from Shopify because they know me very well. They know how much I'm selling. They know what's my volumes, how much I'm go- going, etc. So it essentially is being able to get different financial products and offering at the spot and in the context of uh, different actions that I'm doing as either as a consumer or. Okay. And, uh, you know, why is this such a big deal, right? When average person's out hearing, hey, uh, financial products are being integrated into kind of purchase flows. This doesn't sound that interesting. Can't I just use a credit card? Why is this so significant? I think it's amazing from so many different ways. Um, maybe if I had to pick one of them is again, continuing the example of Shopify. If I'm going to be an e-commerce seller going for a loan from a bank, um, they know how to do, you know, auto loans. They can do maybe, um, mortgages. They are going to do the standard stuff, but e-commerce, what is that? Who are you? Like, who are you selling to? How does that actually work? This usually financial institution don't know how to treat those type of businesses, new businesses that are informing as part of, as, as part of the internet economy. 
and being able to shift the power and give other companies, tech companies, tech enabled companies or platform the ability to offer those financial services to the customers that they already know and they are interacting with on a regular basis, actually going to create a lot of opportunities and value for these consumer or businesses that are going to be able to access more financial services as opposed to what they had with the traditional financial industry. Yeah. You know, when I look at it, I'm thinking, wow, this is kind of expanding the long tail of financing options to almost anything you can buy now, which is seems insignificant. But uh, when you look at it from that, the macro perspective and the impact on the way people actually purchase, it's massive trend, massive, massive. Tell us about Noble. What are you guys doing? How do you play in that market? Definitely. So Noble, we I like to think about us as the as the enablers for the for for basically the shift of lending products from the offline to the online. So basically fintech, I guess the main domain that um, was able to shift from the offline world to the online world was payments, companies like Stripe, etc., that really helped um, either e-commerce sellers, SaaS businesses to being able to process payments online very easily. Um, that was the first wave. But lending products are much more complex. They have different set of infrastructure that they require different set of regulations. And Noble is the infrastructure to allow that to move those financial products, lending products from the offline world to the online world and essentially supporting the embed, embedded finance um, thesis around, you know, again, enabling new companies, tech enabled um, companies to build those different lending products in much more efficient ways, efficient way, scalable way um, that will eventually um, be the benefit of different, you know, both consumer and businesses that are trying to consume those different lending products. What were embedded finance companies doing before you were around? How did they do, how do they underwrite any of the customers? I mean, kind of when we bumped into you, I couldn't believe this didn't, wasn't already in place given the volume that's flowing through the market? Yeah. So first of all, in lending, you have so many problems. You have, you know, so many challenges, starting with the different licenses that you need. Um, then where do you bring the capital that you need in order to empower those different lending offerings? Um, but also underwriting is the heart of the problem. And this is where we started to focus on. How do we give companies um, a very easy and intuitive infrastructure that will allow them to build um, the credit underwriting infrastructure from scratch and in a very scalable way. And to your question, what companies have done up until um, this date is basically either this was a great barrier for them to being able to start offering those lending products and or, or if they wanted to pursue that way, they had to build everything in-house. Um, and eventually it's a major challenge. So again, a company like Shopify that has the means to start building this stuff, um, they can do it. But we actually want to make sure that not just the Shopify, Shopify's of the world will be able to do this, but every company that actually want to create more meaningful relationship with their existing customer base by uh, giving them additional financial products will be actually be able to do that in a very um, easy and efficient manner. How did you get here? I know you've been an entrepreneur for a while. What What is your story? How did you land doing this company? Yeah. So actually me being as entrepreneur, I think it goes way back. Um, just in my first experience um, when I was, I think, 17 or 18. So I, I grew up in Israel. Um, like every good Jewish boy, I went to a shiva um, in Jerusalem. And it was near the Western Wall. And uh, me being in the yeshiva, I think one, the other day I saw a poster. Somebody is looking um, a, a guy for his uh, son's bar mitzvah to arrange all the food, basically to bring a table with the food and drinks to near the Western Wall and basically help them to set everything up. I took the challenge. I, I, it was easy money. I started with this instance and I actually saw that it's actually a problem. Like a lot of families are trying to do bar mitzvahs in the Western Wall every day. 
And it's a real challenge to bring all the food with you from the parking lot and walk 20 minutes by foot and bring it to the Western Wall. So I thought to myself, hey, this is a nice opportunity. I didn't think in those terms back then, but it was like, hey, it's something here. Maybe I can actually expand uh, what I've done. And uh, and since this first instance, uh, one event became two events and two events became five events a week in the busiest weeks um, that I had. And marketing, I have a lot of experience in marketing to synagogues, if you want to ask me about that later. Um, but eventually the business grew quite, uh, qu- quite significantly in, uh, in like five or six months. Um, and this was my first experience. And I think this has really caught me. Like I really built something with my own two hands and started something from zero to one. Um, so I think this is something as a, again, as a teenager, really, you know, shape my, my way later on in life. So after that, um, you know, army, at least in Israel, you have a mandatory army service and then university. Even when I started my career in the tech industry, I was always passionate about going into places where it was zero to one, where the part of the business that nobody wanted to touch, everybody says it's, you know, I, I don't want to deal with that and try to make um, something great out there. Um, essentially, those experiences working in other companies led me eventually to also start Noble two years ago, um, which is, again, my second experience doing zero to one. And I'm really having fun with that. That is like the Israeli version of a lemonade stand story. A great, <laughs> small, you know, almost kiddish business, but a real one. Um, that's beautiful. Now you're you're obviously based out in Tel Aviv right now. That is correct. Uh, yeah, I know that's the hub out there. And for I think most people know this, Israel far and away is the most innovative entrepreneurial country per capita in the world. Far more than the U.S., China, everywhere on a per capita basis. What are the challenges of starting a company in Israel? I mean, it sounds like when you hear kind of that line that it's kind of a slam dunk. You know, to be an entrepreneur out there, what are the what are the issues people face? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think that you know the the first uh, the first thing is bureaucracy. You know, not just being you know building a startup, but even building a business. Uh, at least here in Israel, it's uh, sometimes can get very complicated. How do how do you have to deal with the authorities or the banks and things like that? It's uh, something which is quite complicated. Um, the second one, I guess, you know, as especially in the tech uh, industry, um, the ability to be able to start selling very quick, um, especially to the U.S. This is the big, the biggest market. This is where you're gonna find the biggest customers, and this is where you're gonna eventually w- investors would like you to scale the business. So, of course, you know, time zones and uh, and uh, other cultural differences are sometimes could be a barrier for, for Israeli entrepreneurs when they're trying to build their business. But essentially, I also think uh, that is an advantage. It really forces you from day one to kind of go and meet the real customers and not to go to your friends and family and the ones that will adopt your product in day one. Um, so actually, at least for the, for the last point, I actually look at this as an advantage. Tomer, uh, you're clearly an entrepreneur, top to bottom. Thank you for being on today. Thank you very much, Mark. Have a great day. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Uh, That's the episode for today. Peace out from Jackson Hole, Wyoming.